Hello, my name is Bradley, and this is SumSub, a channel on how to survive in the online jungle. Today, I'm going to conduct an experiment. I'll buy an old laptop from eBay and try to restore the personal data of the guy who sold it to me, even if that guy thinks that he's already deleted everything. This experiment will show you how much information you can learn about anyone by simply examining their old device. Of course, there are very effective methods of protection here, and I'm also gonna tell you about those, but first, Let's go to the one, the only. This is eBay. So to understand what to look for, you'll need to know the basic principles of information recovery. When we're talking about old hard drives, when deleting files, the data is not really deleted at all. The space occupied by them, rather, is simply marked as free. And until new files override the old ones, it's not really difficult to restore that old data. Moreover, the larger the disk, the higher the probability that one will be able to restore the deleted files. So after going through several dozen ads in the UK, I came across this, the Dell Inspirion 6400 with Windows 10 pre-installed. According to the characteristics, it was likely that this computer was used for surfing the internet and storing photos and text documents. It's not really suitable for much more when you look at the characteristics. So what we have here is a 120 gigabyte hard drive. The disk space is just about right, and most importantly, it's the kind of ordinary hard drive that you might expect. If there's any deleted information, it shouldn't be that hard to get a hold of it. However, just in case there's nothing there at all, we'll order a second one as a backup. I think this one will do for that. Sure, it's got a weaker processor and there's one gigabyte less RAM, but the disk has the same space as 120 gigabytes. Also, the system was reinstalled here. The listing says a fresh installation of Windows 7. This means that part of the data has certainly been overwritten, but that's also quite interesting for our experiment. So I guess, let's order it. Let's open it. This is actually really funny because this looks exactly how I pack Christmas presents. <laughs> right, nice, we've got a charging cable here and another Dell Inspirion. Nice. Looks very worn, but I suppose that's what we want. I bet there's lots of juicy data in this one. The main thing that's important to understand is that you cannot turn on purchased laptops. From the first ever reboot, the laptop can start installing updates, indexing files, and ultimately overwriting deleted files. Keep this in mind in case you accidentally, ironically, format your hard drive. So first I took out the hard drive from the first laptop and connected it to another computer via a docking station. There are many programs for data recovery and they differ in interface complexity, analysis algorithms, the number of settings, and of course, the price. I'll not bore you with the details of how they work because for us, the most important thing is the result. Besides, I'm not giving you a tutorial on how to extract private data from someone else's laptop. I'm simply showing you the risks and demonstrating how to avoid certain consequences. So my first attempt to unravel people's secrets will take place using the hard drive of the more powerful laptop with Windows 10 installed. Now I had mixed emotions here because first of all, the attackers or the potential attackers wouldn't be very lucky in this case because I only recovered seven files and it seems that they're all located on the computer's desktop. Now this wasn't an ideal result for our experiment, but let's have a look at the catch nevertheless. So we found a shortcut for the Microsoft Edge browser Come on, who's actually using this as a shortcut? And five documents. Judging by the names, these are two CVs, a list of keywords, and a presentation about safe sex. You've got a picture as well. And judging by the service file, they'd all been downloaded from the network. None of these files could actually be opened as they're deeply corrupted. I even used an online service, recoverytoolbox.com, and it reported that none of the files actually contained data. By the way, as you noticed, I partially hid the names of the documents. I mean, there were names and surnames, and I'm, of course, going to hide faces and photos and other important personal data for obvious reasons. I'm going to repeat this again. My goal is to warn you with the help of an experiment and not to reveal the private lives of laptop vendors. 
Although, in this case, the former owners knew what they were doing. The computer was clean. But the older model, unfortunately, turned out to be a real Klondike of information. And this is despite the fact that the seller stressed that he had reinstalled the operating system. 126,000 files were recovered, 65 gigabytes of data. You know, I didn't expect this at all. After trying really hard with the first computer, I was worried that we might have to order another couple of laptops. But, as you can see here, this is still a bit of a hellscape. I can sort this out though. The program that restored the information basically failed to cope with the structure of the folders. All of the files are in separate folders with strange names. There are no familiar files like My Documents or Recycle Bin. The files are rather divided by type. Therefore, I'm going to sort the folders firstly by size in descending order, and I'll start with the largest ones first. The data that I'm interested in might be hidden there. The largest folder on this computer takes up 16 gigabytes, but it's full of libraries and service files. If you dig through the names of these files, you can get some additional information about the owner of the computer. For example, I can find out what non-standard equipment has been connected to the computer and determine what programs were used. See, for example, this file says that Google Chrome was installed as a browser, but I didn't find any traces of Firefox, so they probably used Google Chrome. It's also clear that the owner had the need to burn CDs and DVDs. In the older versions of Windows, as I recall, there were no convenient tools for this, so that's probably why the Nero Burn-In ROM program appeared in the system. I also found a bunch of drivers for Epson and HP printers. They were all installed together with the system, and this is indicated by the date of their creation. Therefore, these files here really mean nothing. But this actually gave me an idea. Instead of ordering the files by name, I'm going to sort them by the date of creation. Now this is quite clever because then the oldest ones will be related to the original installed system, but the newer ones will belong to the programs that are installed by the user manually. This helps me to find traces of a flash player and also program for creating data backups called ECS Toto Backup. It seems that before the sale, the owner transferred the data to another computer. In the folder you see on screen now, I found 204 archive files. In total, they take up another 8.5 gigabytes. I tried to unzip some of them, but each time I received messages that the files were corrupted. This folder really didn't add any clarity here as to who the owner was. But in the next folder, there were 600 files with music and lessons on working with Windows. So this is quite cool. I managed to figure out what was playing in the ears of the laptop's previous owner. Wanna listen? The playlist turned out to be a curious mixture of light disco, electronic music in the style of Jean-Michel Jarre with Turkish motives too. The antediluvian WAV files were restored without problem. I noticed that some files actually contained several tracks at once, which sometimes happens when you digitalize CD discs. This cannot be said about music in MP3 format, however, for about half of these files didn't survive deletion and actually merged into a random set of sounds. But judging by the names and the surviving files, there's just much more electronic music here. Along with the music in the folder, for some reason there were six torrent files. I copied them into mtorrent, but none of them could be started. The data in them was unfortunately corrupted. Video files also suffered badly. Those downloaded from the torrent couldn't be restored, but I did find a couple of anime clips by Hayao Miyazaki, which were actually intact. The owner of the computer tried to copy them from a DVD, but it didn't work out very well. The program left its watermarks right on top of the video. And this is what the resurrected Futurama series looks like. Our policy is, if for any reason you're not completely satisfied, I hate you. It's back from the dead. Now this is all quite funny, but so far it really hasn't given us much information about the owner. So I decided to change my search strategy. I'm not going to click all of the folders in a row, as there are more than 25,000 of them on the disk, but rather to search for individual file formats. My first really valuable source was ordinary photos, JPEG files. There are almost 6,000 of them here. Mm -hmm. 
Now I can't show you all of these photos in full, after all this is someone else's life, but I think you should know what strangers can find on your computer, even if you think you've deleted everything before selling it. So we will take a look at some, but don't worry, I'm gonna hide all of the faces and personal details. So to begin with, I will find all of the restored photos. To do this, I'm just gonna type in a line in the search bar, dot JPEG. So the first images I found are music album covers. Then came the photos clearly taken during a vacation. The first pictures were taken somewhere among nature, in a park or a forest, and I can't say yet with more certainty. I mean, there's no indication of the shooting location in the EXIF data of the images, but judging by the size of the photos, they were taken on a digital camera and not on a mobile phone. But there's really no information about this either. The images have a density of 96 dots per inch, therefore most likely they're not originals, but rather versions processed in a graphic editor and prepared for viewing on electronic devices. Images from cameras usually have at least 300 dpi, and this also explains the empty metadata. Perhaps a professional botanist could come to the studio and determine the location of the shooting for these pictures, but I can't for sure. Therefore, I'm gonna scroll further to see if I can find out any new information. <laughs> so this is the cover of some porn video, I guess. Now, this is indicated by the player icon in the corner of the frame. The picture wasn't completely restored, as you can see, so I don't even have to censor it. But by the way, this doesn't mean that the form owner actually downloaded porn. The picture could have found its way onto the hard drive via a website that was accessed from the computer itself. But the photos of cats that you can see here clearly were saved on purpose. Now, pictures with friends and parties don't really provide me with any more info. You can just see the same faces over and over again. And surely these are family members or friends of the laptop owner. Most likely, this guy himself is present in the pictures. But I think this picture is far more interesting. This is clearly some kind of mosque, and in the background you can guess that there's a big city there. You've got hills and skyscrapers. Now, I already know where this is, but let's just confirm. I'm gonna upload this image to Google and try to find similar ones. Bingo! Google has clearly identified this place as Topkapi, the main palace of the Ottoman Empire. Now, this is one of the most famous sites of Istanbul. So this photo was definitely taken in Turkey, right? Now the search failed to cope with the next photo, simply assuming that it was a tourist attraction. We can only say one thing for sure. It was taken from the side of some boat or ship. However, we found the photo of this very yacht just a few photos later. In addition, someone took a picture of a life buoy on board the ship. Now the name of the vessel is written on the top and the port of registry is written below. I think that says Fethai. <laughs> but I googled this and this is the name of a port city in the southwest of Turkey. Now, I know exactly where one of the owners spent the summer just using this photo. Well, I didn't even have to google this photo. What resident of London doesn't recognise St Paul's Cathedral? In the centre of the picture is a woman who often has appeared in previous pictures. And now I know exactly what her name is where she comes from and where she lives. There was a picture of her passport in the folder with the photos. I've obviously blurred out the real name and age of the girl as well as the numbers on the document. Moreover, I'm gonna call her by some fictitious name, I don't know, Helen will do. Honestly, very sorry that there's so much information left on this disc and I really hope that this video will help you to avoid the same mistakes that were made out of ignorance. Thank God I'm not an intruder, neither is some sub. But how did Helen's passport photo end up in the same place as her vacation photos? Everything's rather simple. Now, I remember when I was in Turkey, the guides warned that it's probably better to leave your passports in the hotel where they're safe and instead carry photocops with you. It seems that the user of the laptop took a picture of her documents in order to print several copies. I didn't find any other passports, however. I'll assume that Helen was on vacation with her friends, not her family members, for instance. So the file gave me a first and a last name, information that Helen now lives in London, although she's originally a German citizen. And I can see the town, the height, and the age of our current heroine. Now this passport expired in February of last year, so it's no longer possible to use its number for any fraudulent purposes. But if this computer had got to the attackers any earlier, there could have been real consequences. Admit it, do you also keep copies of your documents on your laptop or your smartphone? Now do you understand why you shouldn't do it? Prepare for unforeseen 
consequences. Now, another place that Helen spent her summer vacation was suggested by a picture of a tourist center sign. Burgos is a large city on the coast of Bulgaria, as it happens. Helen spent another vacation in Canada. I found a photo of the Olympic torch in Vancouver, which pointed that out. And apparently she was there for some kind of family celebration, perhaps to visit relatives or friends. You can probably make this out from the photos, right? And then I found out that Helen was interested in books about Harry Potter. She loves horror and science fiction. This was hinted to me by the covers of audiobooks that were in the same folder. Perhaps she listened to them on vacation. Stephen King, George Martin. Now I know which authors I can discuss if I ever meet Helen. God, that's quite creepy, isn't it? And it also became clear what Helen once did for a living. Among the pictures, I found screenshots of correspondence about photos for the website of some sort of church. Unfortunately, the quality here is very poor, but the topics and the letters can still be made out. And by the way, the photos of the wedding ceremony themselves were also found in this folder. And just below, I found another interesting screenshot. It shows the settings for accessing the files of some site that was hosted on dreamhost.com. This confirms to me the idea that Helen was associated with the development of websites, or perhaps editing. Maybe she was a content manager or was responsible for the photos and pictures. I tried using these access attributes, but such a site no longer exists, unfortunately. I was interested in following the trail of photos here. These were taken in nightclubs, and the author clearly focused on the person standing at the DJ deck. In the name of one of these images, the word Rickster was found. A quick search led me to the page of the artist with the same name on Last FM. Music turned out to be quite in the spirit of those tracks that I met when I was analyzing music files. In addition, I found another screenshot. It had music files that someone had uploaded to the site, all on the same dreamhost.com. Usually such screenshots are added to the reports on work performed. So although I wasn't able to restore all of the photos, the portrait of Helen is acquiring more and more new features. Shall we continue to search for images? Well, JPEG is far from the only image format. From the popular ones, you've got BMP, GIF, and PNG. For example, these images are clearly lessons on the basics of web design. They talk about the layout rules, they teach you how to work with Epson printers. It seems that the version about her being a content manager is becoming more and more well, realistic. By the way, the pictures with the tips for Epson file manager show a German interface. This is an extra hint to the origin of Helen, which corroborates with her passport. It's unlikely that an Englishman would watch such lessons in German. Now, since we're talking about programs, I decided to run a search for files with the .exe extension. These are executable program files. Now, when you click on the shortcut in the menu or on a desktop, most often it launches a .exe file. Here, I found programs for working with PDF files, antivirus programs, tools for burning CD and DVD discs, and here's actually a plugin for flash animation. And here is a program for uploading files to websites. Now, this list of programs strengthens my confidence in what I already know about Helen. And I'm also sure that besides Helen, another person also used the computer. And how do I know that? Well, do you remember my video in which I told you that visited sites leave small text files on your computer? Well, these files are called cookies, and they store various information that helps the site to basically run better. So some sites actually store the username in such files. Look, these are Helen's cookies. Do you see? They start with the name, and after the at symbol is the name of the site that left this data. Predictably for a traveler, she visits British Airways, Booking.com, and car rental sites. She gets her news from The Guardian and orders DVDs on lovefilm.com. But these are files of another user. Let's call him Mark. Look, Mark is interested in electronic music and robotics. He frequents Nintendo's websites and uses file sharing services. Mark listens to music through Winamp and records his compositions on Sound Upload. He watches videos on YouTube and visits sites with, well, questionable content. And Mark is also looking for schools on the website schoolsfinder.direct.gov. Please note, the first file for Helen was created on October 24th, 2006, and the first mention of Mark appeared on July the 8th, 2008, a year and a half later. Since April 2010, only Mark has been using the laptop. Based on the interests and these dates, I would venture to assume that Mark is the son or the younger brother of Helen. 
At first, he was not allowed to use the computer, and then he sat at it in turn with his mother. A couple of years later, Helen got a brand new Toshiba, and the old Dell, well, was left to Mark. This, by the way, can explain such a mixture of music. Helen might have preferred European disco with Turkish motives, while Mark listened and tried to create his own electronic music. Now, when I thought about making this video, I was sure that I'd have to put photos through Google or I'd have to use the services of data brokers. But with a passport, this is just no longer necessary. I just went to Facebook and found a Helen by a combination of first name, last name, and place of residence. And now I want to ask you a simple question. Should I try to get in touch with Helen? Tell her the whole story and check how close I was to the truth? Or maybe you shouldn't scare a person like that. Suddenly she'll take me for a fraudster or some kind of extortionist, right? But what do you think? Well, let me know in the comments and we can decide together whether we're gonna shoot a continuation of this video with Ellen involved. Bill Gates alone knows how much information could have been extracted from this laptop. After digging a little longer, you can probably find financial documents, restore correspondence, and much, much more. Yes! We've wasted building a worthless piece of shit! It's no wonder that stuff like this can end up on the dark web and Sold. It's just that I didn't really set myself the goal of finding all that data and digging out everything I could. It would take many days of work and if I were a motivated attacker then of course I'd do just that, but thank god I'm one of the good guys, right? But these simple examples were enough to show you the danger of letting your electronic devices fall into the wrong hands. So look, why did I start all this and why did I do this bloody creepy experiment in the first place? Well, to draw your attention to a real serious threat. Do you think only famous people should be afraid of these sort of things? I'm gonna start with this. Uh, I, 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 brought a, I brought a gift with me right here. Well, brother, it's the other way around. There's obviously a hunt for famous laptops and tech, so security specialists are always on hand with this stuff. And by the way, a Hollywood millionaire isn't exactly gonna sell their old laptop on eBay, right? Recovered data is a threat. Imagine that it's your computer that falls into the hands of an attacker. Information about your family, your hobbies, and your interests can all be used to create a scenario for a social engineering attack. To be honest, there's a lot more information in the service files that can be used to create a cast of your digital identity and use it for fraudulent purposes for maybe authorization on secure services, or for conducting questionable banking operations. And in the end, your immodest photos that you thoughtlessly took and then deleted many years ago can pop up on popular porn sites. Do you really need all of these problems? If not, then now I'm gonna tell you how to avoid them. I'm going to leave links to useful software and services in the description of this video, so go check them out. But look, here's some general advice. Do not delete files through the recycle bin. Use special programs that overwrite deleted files with a combination of random characters. One rewrite cycle is usually enough for ordinary people, but specialists of the US Department of Defense overwrite confidential information three times, and the NSA seven times in a row. Modern versions of Windows actually do a very good job of deleting data when one chooses to reset to factory settings, and this was demonstrated by my failure with the first laptop but there may have been deleted files hidden on your disk. If you want to get rid of them, just use an old trick. First, delete everything except for the operating system, and then fill the disk with bulky garbage to the limit. For example, hundreds of copies of the same movie. Now that's all gonna overwrite these previously deleted files. If you just bought a computer, I recommend creating an encrypted disk for the data. The files that you store and delete on it are almost impossible to restore. This method will protect you from most types of attacks, but you're still vulnerable to the attacks on system files. Now if you're just choosing a new computer, give preference to models with SSD. Not only do they work faster, but it's much more difficult to recover information from them. The main thing is to not disable the trim function, and that's basically responsible for the background cleaning of memory cells. Now starting with Windows 7, this stuff is kind of enabled by default, but some programs or drivers may still disable it. And for the most important piece of advice that I have, you should subscribe to our channel. Otherwise, my name is Bradley, this has been SumSub, and you are safe in the online jungle for another day. I'm gonna see you in the next video.